In this video we're going to be reviewing a book that is published relatively recently but has a message that is relatively timeless. The book is 4,000 Weeks, written by Oliver Berkman and with the telling subtitle Time Management for Mortals. Welcome to Strategy Books, introducing leaders to the books and ideas that make a difference and most importantly the books that can help you make a difference in the world around you. Hit the subscribe button to stay current and that bell to be notified every time there's a new video up. I'm Mark Mullally, follow me here and you can also connect on Twitter and Instagram at strategy underscore books. And as always, the links to everything we discussed today can be found in the description below. So let's get started. This is a book that I discovered fairly recently. Uh, I picked it up while I was working through the development of strategy books, my personal strategy workshop. Oliver Berkman, until last year, was a regular contributor to The Guardian newspaper in the UK. He's a, na he's a native of the UK, he lives now in New York, and his column, which was produced for their magazine, was variously described as being either about psychology or about productivity, and that seem to be used relatively interchangeably. Uh, it's a really, really great column to read. I would encourage you to go back and look at the Guardian's archives. They don't have a paywall, it's available for free. Uh, and there are some really, really useful insights. But this is a book that he has uh, produced that doesn't synthesize that so much as I guess uses the topic as a bit of a springboard. It's his second book. Uh, he is also the author of Happiness for People That Can't Stand Positive Thinking. So there's a bit of sardonic, sardonic British wit there and speaks to both a type of book and also a type of reader that is possibly a little bit contrarian or at least enjoys a slightly different take on the topic. As I said, I picked it up when I was building Strategy Making Workshop and the reason for that was relatively straightforward. The subtitle, Time Management for Mortals, said a lot and it very much connected with the ideas that I was exploring within the workshop around personal strategy, around making choices, around how we actually manage our time. What resonated in particular for me was the title, 4,000 Weeks. That is not accidental and it is not necessarily intended to be obscure. If you live to be 80, as many of us aspire to do, at least, what that means is you'll have spent about 4,000 weeks on this planet. And so the question becomes, if that's what you have available, if our finite time on this journey is 4,000 weeks, what do you choose to do with them? And how do you maximize their benefit for you? And asking that question is its own challenge. Because for a lot of people, how do you maximize the benefit for you is going to sound like, how do I optimize my productivity? How do I, uh, especially in something about time management, how do I refine my schedule? How do I get even more done? How do I prioritize most effectively so that I can accomplish all of the things? And that's our perspective, but it's not necessarily the only perspective. So let's talk about a little bit about what I think the author was trying to do with the book. Uh, in terms of overall key themes, I would argue there are three. Uh, the first one is really making an argument about how we manage time. And I would place emphasis on questioning the definition of the word manage in that statement. Uh, Berkman is a self-confessed productivity junkie. He is a graduate or survivor, depending upon your perspective, of any number of productivity-based tools. He has strived for Inbox Zero, he was a disciple of getting things done, and as a writer of a popular productivity column, he had the benefit of basically being able to say anything that he chose to pursue in terms of tools, software, approaches, techniques, things that he was trying to do, well that was just work, which as he argued it was a little bit like having an alcoholic as your wine reviewer, because he was absolutely down the rabbit hole of how do I optimize and maximize and refine productivity to be able to get all of the things done all of the time. And so that brings us really to kind of the second key theme of this book, which is about making choices. And in making choices, the particular challenge that he speaks about in the book is about 
being accepting of your choices, but recognizing we need to make choices. It's not about how do we do all the things and we cannot have all of the things. And so we need to be able to choose where to focus. And what that means is defining what you want to succeed at, but also being comfortable about choosing where you're not going to be successful in order to be able to make that happen. So for me, some of the highlights, it's a very well written book. It is well researched. It is well structured in that it has a very good narrative flow. It tells us, it tells a story. It tells an important story very, very well. And there is a, a logical flow and a narrative that is also well referenced, well re researched, supported by citations and extensive footnotes to reinforce the argument and provide credibility to the assertions that he's actually making within the book. It is more of a narrative. This is not a time management tome. This is not a practical how to. It's trying to provide a perspective. It's trying to provide insight. It's trying to shift focus and priorities. And, and so it reads like a, a number of different books. I would think of Malcolm Gladwell as, as a good example of that, where what you're reading is a narrative story about a particular topic that is well told, that is entertaining, that is witty, that is well structured but then depends upon a lot upon you to decide what are you going to do with that. And so when we think about gaps and concerns, um, it does have a clear narrative, but that doesn't say that there's actually a clear structure. So a review of the table of contents, for example, won't tell you much about what the book is about or what's coming in any particular chapter. The titles are always relevant once you've read the chapter you'll know why that title was the title. But it's not a forecast, it's not a, a signal of, here's what's coming and here's what you need to know about this particular chapter. Reading the table of contents to be able to understand the structure of the narrative isn't something that you're gonna be successful. And it doesn't tell you how to get there either. There are no techniques and tools, there are no insights and perspectives in terms of specifically, concretely, what do you actually do with this? It won't tell you how to make choices. And what those are remain an exercise for you. That said, it is in an integrated whole. And that's good and bad, because either you'll accept the argument and find it valuable and useful, or you won't. And that's a choice that you have to make. And in making that choice, arguably you're going to have needed to get through the entire book to be able to come to a reasoned decision. Not that that is in any way a hardship. As I said, it's an excellent, enjoyable, um, entertaining read, but it's an important read. What I got out of it, um, for me, in terms of relevance, it was a perspective that I needed to hear. And arguably, I think many of us do. And I say that even while I am on the tail end of having actually just developed a personal strategy workshop that many others have found meaningful and insightful and transformative and valuable in helping them work through and make choices about priorities. It's not that I don't understand both the mechanics and the logic and the rationale and the reason for being a for being able to make effective choices, but the challenge is always in the doing. Because in choosing to do something, we also need to be able to make choices about what aren't we going to do. So where it fits, it's a, it's a book that is more commentary and philosophy than how to. It's not trying to give you better strategies. It's not trying to give you a different perspective per se in how to think about your to-do list or how to think about how to get all of the things done. Um, what it's trying for is actually really a second order shift in thinking to be able to say not how do I get all the things done, but why do I think I need to get all the things done? Why is that what we see as the dominant priority, the focus, the emphasis that we need to have, how we keep score and how we're going to decide whether we won or not. So what he's trying to do is be able to move past the treadmill of how do you actually cram as much as you possibly can into any given 24 hour period and to be able to make choices about what actually does matter and also in that what doesn't or more appropriately perhaps 
what matters less? Because that's the choice and that's the challenge. It's not about how do we say yes to the good stuff and how do we say no to the obviously bad stuff? It's how do we say yes to the essential stuff and in doing so say no to things that we care about, things that we think are possibly important, things that we think are valuable to consider or do or try to incorporate into our lives and our experience and, and what where we spend our time, that by doing so is going to rob us from the things that are absolutely truly critical. And that's the challenge. And it's the challenge that all of us have to think about and consider. And so my overall perception, it's a solid perspective and the ideas that it contains within it are important because we all have finite amounts of time. We only have so much time on this planet. When we think about the, the life of the universe and we think about the life of the world, our existence on it is a mere blip. And so the challenge is how do we make that blip not meaningful in the context of the measurement of the universe, but meaningful in the context of our having been here for that period of time. And that's the difficulty is that, you know, we do have finite amounts and we do need to be able to make choices. And oftentimes the risk of not making choices, we just keep sliding things into the future and the future never comes. So there will always be more to get done than you have capacity. Uh, I have, and I think many people are guilty of the same thing, is that once I have done this, I will have time, I will have an effort, I'll have the ability to be able to focus on this thing or this thing or this thing. And there's always something that is there that is urgent, displacing the things that we think are important. And so the issue that we have to resolve is, the problem that we need to address is, what gets lost? in order to be able to do the things that we wind up then actually spending our time on. What do we do in terms of the things that we truly enjoy that we keep pushing into the future, that we have passion for, that we actually care about, but because we want to focus or because we want to ensure that it gets the time that it needs or that we, we have the um, intention behind it that we want to, that that isn't now. It's always some other time. What do we do with actually being immersed in the moment and enjoying the experience of time for what it is right now, as opposed to wishing away into the future? So I want to actually briefly share with you an excerpt from the book that I think will be quite relevant. And what that speaks to is, it's the art of creative neglect. And he talks in this about a couple of different principles. And so principle number one is to pay yourself first when it comes to time. I'm borrowing this phrasing from the graphic novelist and creativity coach, Jessica Abel, who bore it in turn from the world of personal finance, where it's long been an article of faith because it works. If you take a portion of your paycheck the day you receive it and squirrel it away, you'll probably never feel the absence of that cash. You'll go about your business, buying your groceries, paying your bills, precisely as if you'd never had that portion of money to begin with. There are limits, of course. This plan won't work if you literally only earn enough to be able to survive. But if, like most people, you pay yourself last instead, buying what you need and hoping there will be some money remaining at the end to put into savings, you'll usually find that there isn't any. And this won't necessarily be because you freighted it away self-indulgently on lattes or pedicures or new electronic gadgets or heroin. Every expenditure might have felt eminently sensible and necessary in the moment that you made it. The trouble is that we're terrible at long-range planning. If something feels like a priority now, it's virtually impossible to coolly assess whether it will still feel that way in a week or a month. And so we naturally err on the side of spending and then feel bad later when there's nothing left over to save. That same logic Abel points out applies to time. If you try to find time for your most valued activities by first dealing with all the other important demands on your time, in the hope there will be some left over at the end, you'll be disappointed. And so if a certain activity really matters to you, a creative project say, though it could just as easily be nurturing a relationship or activism in the service of some cause, the only way to be sure it will happen is to do some of it today, no matter how little, 
and no matter how many other genuinely big rocks may be begging for your attention. After years of trying and failing to make time for your illustration work, by taming her to-do list and shuffling her schedule, Abel saw that her only viable option was to claim time instead, to just start drawing for an hour or two every day and to accept the consequences, even if those included neglecting other activities she sincerely valued. If you don't save a bit of time for you now, out of every week, as she puts it, there is no moment in the future when you'll magically be done with everything and have loads of free time. This is the same insight embodied in two venerable pieces of time management advice, to work on your most important project for the first hour of each day, and to protect your time by scheduling meetings with yourself, making, marking them in your calendar so that other commitments can't intrude. Thinking in terms of paying yourself first transforms these one-off tips into a philosophy of life, at the core of which lies this simple insight. If you plan to spend some of your 4,000 weeks doing what matters most to you, then at some point, you're just going to have to start doing it. Just within those couple of pages, there's, there's a lot of value and a lot of perspective that speaks to prioritizing and also speaks to the challenge of prioritizing in that we tend to, we very frequently set other people's priorities ahead of our own, the, the urgent immediate ahead of the important and valuable. And so if we really do want to reach the end of our 4,000 weeks, having done things that we care about and we manage, then what we need to do is be finding the time and building the time in terms of being able to do that. So what I think the author accomplished, he, he makes an important argument and he does it well. And I really actually valued and enjoyed reading the book. Uh, it works to try to shift a perspective. It's working to be able to try to get a second order effect in terms of, of thinking in. And like many writers, arguably, he's the first to admit he's the person that probably needs to hear it most. And this is true for many of us, many of us that write. We write the things that we need to hear. And this actually reminds me of a quote that's attributable to Neil Gaiman. Um, he says, I write something so that I know what I think about it. And... This is the thing, writers often focus on the thing they need to know most. I certainly do. And, and what I find is that's actually incredibly true for others as well. Because the challenge is taking your own advice. Now, what the author missed, I, I'm not sure if this is actually a miss so much as it might be inevitable. I read this book initially about two months ago. So it's January now. I wrote it in, or read it in early part of November. And at the time it resonated. I appreciated the message. Um, I agree with what it was saying. But the challenge is, unless you actually choose to do something with that, that is what it actually winds up simply remaining. The perspective is valuable, but the prompt to do something with that is everything. So how it contributes, it's a good book. It's on an important topic and it tries to challenge some very long held beliefs about productivity. That is its gift, but is it's also its challenge because we are very rooted in and many of, of, of the perspectives that we are rooted in, in terms of our behavior, in terms of our drive, in terms of how we think about our time, in terms of how we think about our priorities, is, is kind of really stuck into how we think and how we function and breaking out of that and taking the time and having the conscious will to be able to do that is the difficult thing. And so what's still needed? There's, there's a need for a roadmap of where do you go this to provide the structure of how do you actually take that diff difficult journey and to help think through the questions and to be able to find the answers and to be able to prompt the exploration that's going to allow any one person to be able to find, so what are my priorities for me? What are the things that I do want to invest in being successful at? And what am, I, what am I prepared to be able to give up? Now, the author does include what he describes as 10 tools at the end. But these are not 10 mechanic processes or activities or um, ways of functioning in terms of doing time management differently. They're prompts, they're questions, they're, they're things to think about and explore. 
They're areas of consideration and meditation to be able to think through what really does matter. Where thinking that through, dealing with those questions is actually going to require a lot of work and a lot of soul searching and a lot of challenge for people to be able to really get comfortable with being able to choose and to being able to make trade-offs and to be able to be comfortable with why those trade-offs aren't just useful, but are in fact essential and necessary. So should you read it? I would say unequivocally, yes, absolutely. I think everybody on the planet should read it. It's an important book. It's an important book with an important message. But the risk is that most of those who actually need to hear it are the ones that are least likely to. And that's perhaps the challenge of any book of this nature. Um, the challenge there is what you deal with within that. I mean, wh what you do with your life is a deeply philosophical question. And so there's a lot of philosophy embedded within this book. And it's actually one of the gifts of it is that while there are a lot of critical and challenging ideas, those are actually presented well. They're not painful to read. And where there are obscure ideas presented, it's acknowledged as being obscure, and then yet presented in a way that's actually accessible and meaningful and valuable. You're never left feeling that what you're reading is a book of philosophy with an agenda of trying to be able to make you better, even if innately, that's exactly what the book is about. So what should you look for in terms of reading it? I would read this book with yourself in mind first and foremost, and I would ask you, how you relate to the material as you read it. So where you accept something at face value, challenge yourself. And, and that might sound like an ironic thing to say. When you take something at face value, challenge it. But do you know it? And do you actually do it? You may find things that, yes, innately you agree with, and yet the actual behaviors associated with the thing you've just read about, they don't actually show up. Most of us know in order to be able to be healthy and happy, we should exercise, we should eat well, we should get sleep, we should drink in moderation, we probably shouldn't smoke, we should spend time with those who are most important to us. These are almost trite truisms. And yet when we actually challenge people on, so how well do you do at doing that? Score yourself on a scale of one to 10 on each of those different dimensions, many of us will very consciously admit we don't score nearly as high as we'd actually like to. Now, where something's uncomfortable though within the book, take stock of that too. What's the discomfort? What feelings does it prompt? What's the unease that it's creating? What does that actually mean for you? Be willing to actually stick with that and think about it and work through it in terms of being able to find the consequences. How deep should you go? This is going to be my only one real it depends answer. Because there is a lot of depth within the book. And there's a lot that can actually be mined, particularly if the perspective is new. And if some of what it's calling for and some of what it means for you is challenging in order to be able to work through. For some, there will be value in going back and rereading. The challenge there is, it's gonna be a full reread because it's not something that is structured to be able to just go and dip into. Even though I know, relatively speaking, what the narrative flow is, if I'm trying to find a particular passage that was about this particular topic, there's no easy way for me to be, to be able to dive into it without going page by page and trying to find it. But for many, it's going to be a rewarding reread. This is a book that I could absolutely see value and appreciation in coming back to again, whether that's in a few months or a few years, up until the point where it isn't. And that's the wonderful thing and the interesting thing about rereading books. Every time that we approach it, we might find something new. We often will find something new up until the point where it served its purpose. But once you've reached that point with this book, you will be much further ahead than you are right now. Thanks for joining us on Strategy Books. We'll be back with another episode soon. If you're interested in the books we talked about today, you can find links to them in the description below. Be sure to subscribe. And if you enjoyed today's recording, please hit that like button as well. It helps others to be able to find the recording. 
Let me know what you got out of the book in the comments below, and comment as well if you have any questions or if you have ideas for a future book. Thanks again for joining us in this episode, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.